On December 11, 1992, during the morning hours, a local resident, while walking his dog along the 2800 block of East Charleston Boulevard in Las Vegas, stumbled upon the lifeless body of 31-year-old Lori Ann Pereira. The brutal nature of this crime sent shockwaves through the community, leaving residents horrified and bewildered by such an act of violence. Unbeknownst to them, this tragedy was only the beginning. Just over a year later, on January 11, 1994, a mere 1.9 miles away from the first crime scene, a garbage collector found the body of 35-year-old Pearl Wilson Ingram hidden beneath trash in a dumpster on the 4,400 block of East Charleston Boulevard. This second gruesome discovery reignited fears and raised pressing questions. Were these heinous acts committed by the same individual? What motive could someone possibly have to target these women? These incidents unfolded in the vibrant city of Las Vegas, often dubbed Sin City, which serves as the bustling county seat of Clark County, Nevada. As the 25th most populous city in the United States, Las Vegas is globally famous as a major resort destination, marked for its extensive casinos, upscale shopping, exquisite dining, and dynamic entertainment and nightlife. Nestled within the Mojave Desert, Las Vegas stands for the exciting experiences it has to offer. However, beneath the city's glittering surface lies a darker side, where the allure of the neon lights sometimes draws in elements of crime. 1961 saw the birth of Lori Ann Pereira. Although not much is known about her personal life, some information can be derived from a recent statement made by her eldest daughter. She wasn't an only child and was raised alongside her brothers and sisters. She had three daughters. Given that their father was never around, she was a devoted mother who tried her best to provide for her children. Regrettably, though, her financial situation did not allow her to support all of her kids, so she had to place her youngest daughter for adoption. This way she thought her daughter would have a better quality of life. Anyone who was familiar with her described her as a lovely woman. In 1992, together with her two elder daughters, she resided in East Charlestown, Las Vegas. Unbeknownst to her, Pearl Ingram, another single mom, also resided just a few miles away from her place. Pearl Wilson Ingram came into the world in 1959 in Nevada, United States. Among eight siblings, she was the fifth one. Her parents' and siblings' names were not disclosed, with the exception of Teresa, her youngest sister. Pearl had a wonderful childhood growing up in a large, loving household with her siblings around. Her sister recalls her as being gregarious, humorous, and appreciative of the simple things in life. Later in life, she gave birth to a son, raising him by herself since the father refused to be a part of the child's upbringing. She was a dedicated and kind mother who tried her best to give her son everything she could. In 1994, she had settled along with her son in L.A. and was making a living. On December 11, 1992, it was just another Friday morning in Las Vegas. A man as usual was taking his dog for a walk in the vicinity of East Charleston Boulevard. As he approached a desolate area east of the Montgomery Ward's retail shop on the 2800 block, he was startled by the sight of what appeared to be a naked body. Upon a closer look, he learned that it was actually a woman's dead body. He immediately contacted the police, who showed up shortly thereafter. Upon their arrival, officers from the Las Vegas Metro Police Department, LVMPD, examined the body and the site of the crime. They subsequently identified the woman as Lori Ann Pereira, who lived nearby. When they examined her body, they discovered that both her ankles and wrists had been tied with visible ligature marks on each. Moreover, there were signs of blunt force trauma to the head. Evidence of a tape covering her mouth was present as well. The Clark County Medical Examiner was then tasked with conducting a thorough autopsy on the body. Her cause of death was determined to be asphyxia, resulting from physical strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Additionally, there was evidence suggesting that she was assaulted before she passed away. 
the autopsy concluded the death to be a homicide. According to the police, sexual assault was most likely the motive for the killing. The police interviewed her acquaintances and loved ones. They also interrogated renowned sex offenders in the area. Unluckily, none of these interviews provided them with any fresh lead to pursue. After investigating every possibility available at their disposal, and still not finding any potential person of interest, the case ended up going cold. A little more than a year had passed since Lori's demise, and life in East Charleston appeared to be returning to normal, until another tragedy took place on January 11, 1994. An employee of Silver State Disposal at his regular garbage pickup route was cleaning up the dumpster beside the Vaughn's grocery store in the 4,400 block of East Charleston Boulevard. As he gathered all the junk, he noticed something beneath the pile. When he got closer, he was shocked to find a woman's lifeless body. He quickly notified the authorities, and they arrived right away. As the LVMPD's detectives set foot on the crime scene, they meticulously examined the body before identifying it as Pearl Wilson Ingram. She was discovered to be unclothed from the waist down, and in a failed attempt to hide the body, somebody had wrapped her up in trash from the dumpster. The body was handed over to the Clark County Medical Examiner for a complete autopsy. Pearl was found to have been manually strangled to death following the autopsy. They also discovered that some of her teeth were gone, and she had abrasions on her face, the bridge of her nose, and above her eyes, suggesting signs of struggle, that she had attempted to fight back against her assailant, and was struck in the face. They also discovered that she had been subjected to assault prior to her passing, and believed that similar to the Lori Pereira case, this was the most plausible motive for the crime. Lieutenant Greg Jolly took charge of the primary investigation. Detectives interviewed people who knew Pearl but found no potential suspects. Due to a lack of conclusive leads, this case ultimately became cold as well. During the 1990s investigations of both cases, the parallels between the two killings were overlooked. The possibility that both women could have been slain by the same perpetrator never crossed the minds of the detectives. Over the last three decades, many LVMPD detectives have looked into these two cases in the hopes of finding anything new. In March 2007, homicide investigators revisited the evidence from Lori Pereira's case. They found traces of seminal fluids in a swab collected during the initial autopsy, prompting more DNA testing. It was used to develop a DNA profile and then uploaded to the CODIS database. However, no match was found. Five years later, in July 2012, while doing a cold case review of Pearl Ingram's 1994 slaying, detectives came across a skin sample that was recovered during the initial investigation. Upon requesting further testing, they were able to recover a DNA profile from it. When this profile was uploaded to CODIS, they identified a match with a profile created for the 1982 case of Lori Pereira, indicating that both crimes were perpetrated by the same perpetrator. This was a significant discovery at the time because it connected these two previously unrelated cases. Nevertheless, at the time, authorities had no method of ascertaining who was this profile of. Thus, the investigation became cold once more. Then in June 2022, the LVMPD cold case unit called for genealogy research into the DNA profile as obtained from the two bodies. Genetic genealogy produces family trees via employing DNA test outcomes through standard genealogical approaches. It can be leveraged to locate the closest relatives of people whose DNA profiles cannot be verified because they aren't included in the database. Othram Labs carried out the family tree analysis in this case. As per the analysis conducted by Othram's in-house genealogy team, Eddie George Snowden Jr. was identified as the suspect in both cases. Detectives then reached out to Snowden's close relatives to get their DNA samples for comparison with the profile they created. The specific family members they called on were not revealed. But after comparing their DNA against the DNA profile they had, 
they were able to ascertain that Eddie George Snowden Jr. was indeed the person responsible in both cases. When they investigated his past, they discovered that he was born in 1937 and was in his 50s at the time of the killings. Investigations into Snowden's records also showed that he had his address listed on the 2800 block of East Charleston, Las Vegas, which is just two miles and within a block from the locations where Lori and Pearl's bodies were discovered, respectively. There were no ties between him and his two victims, and it appeared that he wasn't acquainted with them, but likely chose them since they were alone when he saw them. Police further investigated Snowden's background, discovering that he resided in Sacramento, Santa Cruz, Madeira, Merced, Woodland, and Watsonville between 1956 and 1979. They asked the authorities from all of these jurisdictions to review their cold case records to see if Snowden was involved in any of the crimes there, too. Unfortunately, justice could not be delivered because Snowden, then 80 years old, died from natural causes in February 2017. At last, the families of Lori and Pearl were able to find some comfort after three decades when the heinous monster who had stolen their beloved from them was named. Even if justice did not prevail this time, his identity may perhaps bring some solace to their families. Lori's family chose not to speak to the public, but her eldest daughter Desiree wrote a letter to the LVMPD praising them for their commitment to the case and, ultimately, for its resolution. My mother was a beautiful person who did not deserve to have her life ended at just 31 years old. Nobody deserves to have their life taken. Knowing that her death will not go unexplained, she may finally rest in peace. She also disclosed that she had located her long-lost youngest sister, whom Lori had given up for adoption only weeks prior to the case being solved. I would also like to share that just a little over two weeks ago, through the process of DNA technology, I was able to locate my youngest sister, who my mom had put up for adoption in 1991. My mom is our guardian angel, and I know that she had a part in finding my sister. This was not a coincidence. During a press conference to announce the resolution of the two cases, Pearl's sister Teresa Board spoke to the public thanking the LVMPD investigators for their long and relentless efforts in solving the case. Board stated that her sister, affectionately called Pinky, has a son who currently resides in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She didn't get to become a grandmother, and that's not fair. She additionally credited Snowden's family members for providing their DNA, which led him to be named as the perpetrator. Lastly, while addressing to others like herself, she added, if there are any other families going through what we have been through, keep hope alive, keep God first, and you too will find closure. With that said, what are your thoughts on the use of genetic genealogy in solving cold cases? Are there ethical considerations that should be weighed more heavily? How do you perceive the balance between privacy and the pursuit of justice in cases like these? Let us know in the comments section below. In 1986, a frantic call to the police led detectives to a gruesome crime scene on Colbath Street, where they found Barbara Villarreal's lifeless body brutally stabbed. Beside her lies the murder weapon, and the initial shock pointed all suspicions towards her husband. Could he truly be the one responsible for such a heinous act? Or is there more to this story than meets the eye? On November 7th, 1986. Detectives responded to an incident report at a residence in the 3,600 block of Colbath Street. Upon their arrival, they discovered Barbara Villarreal's lifeless body. She had been stabbed multiple times. Next to her body, detectives reported finding a sizable kitchen knife. Villarreal's husband was allegedly questioned at the scene of the crime and was subsequently ruled out as a suspect. According to the authorities, DNA evidence was collected from the site and added to the CODIS database. Over time, the FBI and Garland police investigators 
pursued a number of leads across the United States and Mexico. The case remained cold until through the application of modern technologies that include DNA genealogy, the brother of Villarreal's husband, 86-year-old Liborio Canales, was identified as the perpetrator by Garland law enforcement. Canales was known to live in a house in the city, according to Lovington police. It was reported that Canales had recently crossed the Mexican border, stepping into New Mexico for celebrating his birthday with family. On Tuesday, July 18th, 2023, Canales was taken into custody by the Lovington Police Department. During his arrest, he complied with the authorities and did not resist. On a federal warrant for the conviction of slaying, Canales was detained at the Lee County Detention Center. When Canales was being held, investigators claimed that he confessed to slaying Villarreal over a family dispute. His bond amount was set at one million dollars. According to court documents, on August 18th, Canales was extradited back to Texas and transferred to the Dallas County Prison. Back in 1986, Villarreal's husband was interrogated by the authorities but was later exonerated. Two years following Villarreal's slaying, in 1988, the husband was shot to death amidst a shootout in Mexico. Canales entered a guilty plea to the murder on Tuesday, March 12th, according to the prosecution, and was sentenced to 20 years in jail. The 86-year-old reportedly told the Garland police detectives that he was angry at Villarreal over a family dispute. Though genealogy had been employed in solving other cases like this, this was the first homicide conviction in Dallas County to have used this approach. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.